Welcome to Just Minding My Business Media. I hope that you're having an amazing day. I am so happy to bring to you Elizabeth, who is named one of the most influential female pioneers in technology. Elizabeth Bienyik is an author, founder, and Fortune 100 leadership veteran focused on good peopling as the secret to exceptional execution. After turning corporate innovation on its head with her own unconventional success story, Elizabeth now helps leaders tap into the individual genius within their teams to unlock unrivaled innovation and uncover joy in the journey. Wow, I just love it, Elizabeth. Thank you, Ida, I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. Wow. So let's go. How did you get on this road? I'm going to call <laughs> you the Elizabeth the Disruptor. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I definitely took the scenic route to get here. I will say that for sure. I, I believe I fell into technology and then I fell into innovation, but I don't really believe in chance. So I do think it was a somewhat of providence that guided my steps along the way, but it was not my intended path. I ended up in technology after a few conversations. Well, I will say I was pretty adamant that I was not a technology person and then landed myself in one of the biggest tech companies in the, in the world. And uh, after a few moves internally, it really just ended up with a lot of conversations and a lot of asking why and a lot of, huh, could we do that better? Could we do that different? And thinking out loud and one thing led to another. And before long, I found myself in a strategy role. And after a few disruptive conversations in that role, I, I worked my way into what ended up being an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial venture, which I never set out to run. It, it really was uh, not the, the path I was planning to take, but it was the path that was needed for me, for the company, for the technology. And it just worked out. Yeah, so I'm a technology queen too. I've been in the industry for over 30 years. So this should be a really good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so tapping into the unique genius of every team member. A lot of companies don't do that. <laughs> yes, I could just start with yes. <laughs> I think the, the bigger the company, the harder that can be too, because it's it's very hard to, when you're going hundred miles an hour, when you have all of your quarterly metrics that you're trying to hit, you have your customers you're trying to please, your stock prices you're trying to keep high. There, there's a lot going on. And I understand that for sure. I think we it's very easy for us as a society to just glance over the people element at times and get really wrapped up around what product we're building. And specifically in technology, as I'm yes. sure you will know, we can get very excited about the new bright and shiny. Like this is going to revolutionize the world. And I can think of so many times over the last two, going on three decades, where something was going to revolutionize the world. But at the same time, business is largely the same as it was 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> because the people have not changed that much. I mean, people are people, no matter where you go, walk of life, country, background, origin, there are certain things about being a human that are just universal. Yeah. And the more as a leader, you can tap into that for your team and align what you're doing to what people actually care about, what people actually want, so that they're excited to be plugged into a, an effort overall. Mm -hmm. I think that is a universal leadership talent that is sorely needed and definitely can be lacking in technology and in innovation, when, which is basically just really fast technology, really cool. And when you really take the time to get to know your people, what they can contribute, how they want to contribute, how they want to be seen, you end up finding and unlocking these different keys along the way that you might not have known existed until you really start having those deep conversations. And that's what really opens up compelling innovation that lasts. Yes, I have to agree with you for sure. So how do you work with companies to get that mindset? It does start with a mindset. I think being open to that for sure, uh, realizing it is not, if you want to be innovative in tech, it is you can't start with the tech because it, it's not the technology that's going to be 
writing the check or using it. So starting with the people and understanding the motivations that go, not just with your customers, we, we spend a lot of time talking about customer mindset and understanding that. And that's absolutely important for sure. But I'm focused more on your internal employee journey and tapping into the mindset of your people and trying to transition from just, yes, I'm here to do a job and build a widget to I'm here solving a problem and I'm not limited to this job description on a one pager or this spot on a hierarchy, but I am part of this broader group that is really trying to move the needle in area X and any way that I can do that, even if it's not something I've done before, it's not something anybody's expecting from me. I might not have the pedigree or check mark boxes, whatever the case is, but we're all in this together. And if I know my management team is going to recognize my value and contribution and helping us move forward on this project that we're all in together, I'm going to bring a lot more to the table than I would if you're just going to regulate me to this, the checkbox list of, do I, do I match these certain list of criteria? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I am so interested in this because at being in the tech industry for over 30 years, innovation, no, don't get me wrong. I've worked for some companies that did value my opinion, but I can pretty much count them on one hand because it wasn't the norm. So who, how do, where's your entry point to get into a company to have this conversation? I do think it all comes from relationship. I don't I don't think anything in this world happens without relationship. Right. That's usually what opens the door. Uh, but the same way I run my innovation projects is the same way I approach any engagement is start small. Start small and have quick wins. So there's a, I recently wrote a book that's coming out next month and there's a chapter in there called, uh, or a section in there called Make It Easy to Get to Yes. And that's a mantra I think I apply to every engagement that I have and every step of that engagement is you can't go in on day one. I have never met you. You know nothing about me. You don't know what I'm bringing to the table, what I'm going to ask of you. And like, hey, let's write a huge check or make make a huge commitment or jump into this thing. You have to make it easy to get to yes. So I think digging in, having those short conversations, I love the 25 minute conversation. You can just about solve any problem in the world, <laughs> starting with a 25 minute <laughs> conversation. I think, I think we uh, undervalue those small starts, mm -hmm. but if you have those short engagements, get to know somebody, have a quick understanding. What's the root? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Let's dig in a little bit, look at a few things, come back and regroup. Are we on the right track and get those, those quick wins to make sure yeah, yeah, this is the progress we want to see. Oh, wow, I didn't think we could get there that quickly. And then it's much easier to get to the next yes and the next yes and the next yes. And before long, you have, you know, moved mountains, if you will. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the power in admitting you don't know something. I like this one because I think having oftentimes been the only person that looked like me at the table, uh, whether that be the only woman, the, the used to be the youngest person, I can't really claim that anymore. Um, whatever <laughs> the case is, I, I didn't come from the normal pedigree, if you will, to be in innovative technology. I didn't go to the Ivy Leagues. I didn't work in the big consulting or, or get the engineering PhD from X university. So oftentimes I was coming at things from a different angle than most of the people I was interacting with. So it was not easy, or not, I'm sorry, not hard to, to admit that I didn't know everything. What I realized is it's, that's very hard if you do have all those check marks, if you do have all the pedigree, realizing sometimes we wear that almost like a badge of honor, and it can be hard to, we look at it as weakness if we're admitting that we don't know everything. But the beauty of innovation is you are by nature exploring something that has literally never been done before you're trying to do something net new mm -hmm. so no one is an expert and i think when you're you're venturing into uncharted waters that area of innovation it is a great leveler because it doesn't matter how many things you've encountered in the past you've never encountered this thing in this way you've never solved this problem yeah. And there is absolute freedom in setting that tone. Um, if you're the an individual in that room, 
trying to bring that tone into the room. But if you're the leader in that room, setting that tone right from the get go and admitting it for yourself, it really frees everybody else up in the room because you're not coming in and say, hey, I'm running this project. I know all the answers. How quick can you guess what's in my head? Nobody wants to play that game. Right. Right. <laughs> but if you come in and say, hey, we're trying to solve this really hard problem that maybe people have tried before, nobody succeeded. Maybe people haven't even attempted it before because they thought it was too off the wall, but we want to see if we can solve this. There is no answer. There is no playbook. So because of that, there's no wrong question. There's no wrong approach here. We're figuring it out as we go. I might have a couple ideas, but here's the problem in those. What do you guys think? Can we poke some holes in it? And you start opening it up from a point of how can we together solve this problem rather than playing this, who's got the bigger briefcase, if you will. So <laughs> it, it creates a, a much nicer environment and it really quickly gets people to want to not be so self-conscious about, am I going to say the right thing or the wrong thing? Because there is no right or wrong thing. And so you get real innovation, you get real brainstorming. Yes, I have to agree. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm loving this because <laughs> that is so needed, you know, because I know something, I have an idea, you have an idea, and that creates synergy. And it also right. supports you in thinking about things that you hadn't thought about. Exactly. And my idea and your idea together are probably a great idea that neither of us would have thought of on our own. Absolutely. And that's really, really exciting. I and think it's fun. It's fun. It's fun, too. I was going to throw one other thing in there, too. I think having kids really helps this, too. <laughs> You realize there is, I think I said this somewhere in my book, that the, the only stupid question is the unasked one. Like there, there literally is no stupid question. And I'm amazed. I have three small kids and I love experiencing the world through their eyes because they ask questions that a lot of times I think people can just brush off of like, oh, that's a stupid question. You just haven't experienced that before. But because they aren't biased by previous experiences, they're asking these really unique, insightful questions. They're like, huh, I never looked at it that way. And if you did look at it that way, ooh, what else could we look at? And it's such a great way to view the world. Yes, it really is. And kids will definitely <laughs> ask the questions and think nothing of it. And then once you answer the question, then you're going to get why, <laughs> more was, mm -hmm. and more why. I'm in it. I'm in it. I, I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> but they keep you on your toes. Absolutely. They Absolutely. Keep you on your toes and they also help you in dealing with the adults in your day-to-day -day. yeah and, I, and that I had that community. actually I use that as one of my interview questions especially when I'm trying to if there is no existing relationship nobody knows so I'm just hiring somebody off of a resume or an application or we're starting from from zero I ask that question I usually ask them to explain something as if they're explaining it to their eight-year-old nephew something something along those lines and see how difficult or hard that is for them and what kind of a creative explanation they come up with. Because I do think that is an incredible challenge of, I'm a big fan of simplicity. How simple can you make this? Because saying an answer that sounds smart, or sounds intelligent, but if people aren't getting it because you threw too many buzzwords in there or mm -hmm. too much industry jargon, or, that's not a smart response. That's just making you sound smart. And I'd rather let, let's be smart in our approach with things. Let's make sure that we're making things as simple to understand as possible. So as many people as possible can come along that journey and add to that idea. And I, I just love simplicity. I don't think you can really go wrong uh, uh -huh. making any pitch or talk or deck or anything, make it as simple as possible. Uh -huh. That's the first way to go. <laughs> yes, and being in the support role in the technology field, you can never come with users with tech. You yeah. have to you have to bring it to them in a way they understand. Absolutely. And that's an everyday thing all day long when you're in a support. Absolutely. Role. Absolutely. Yes, yes, indeed. Wow. So if people want to work with you, how do they connect with you? I have a website, elizabethbienyuk.com. You can reach out on there for I do speaking, consulting, engagements of that nature. Uh, I'm also, you can find me on LinkedIn and I am recently on Instagram and X at Cake on Tuesday. Oh, okay. Awesome. Wow. 
what was the defining moment that inspired you to branch out on your own? I was, worked on a multi-year project. And when that finally got to graduation point, if you will, of moving on, I had that time to think about, do I want to do this again or do I want to do something different? And there were so many learnings that came in that journey of doing that for so many years uh, of moving an innovation project forward inside of a big tech corporation that I really wanted to sit down after that frantic pace of go, 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 and process it and capture all the learnings of it. And that's what prompted me to write my book, Cake on Tuesday. And in that process of taking a pause to write, it made me realize rather than do this again right now, I want to help other people do this because this was hard and I learned a lot of things the hard way and I'm sure I could have learned things faster. And if I could help one other person do that faster in their journey, that would be so gratifying. Mm -hmm. So that's what really caused me to make the shift to help others on this journey, trying to build innovative things. And I love the ability that you you get to enjoy so many other successes along the way, not just your own. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about talent. So how do you spot and develop raw talent beyond that resume? I have uh, one in particular person that I've worked with for many, many years, and I call her my Swiss army knife because she's a little bit of everything. There are, I've gone through so many different iterations of this with her too. Uh, there have been times where she definitely wanted to try something else. It was interest of, hey, I want to try X. I don't really have experience in it. I haven't done it before, but I have this idea. And giving her free reign to go with that. But there are a lot of times where you really are looking at it from the outside in and you're seeing what somebody is good at. I think people can have, when something somebody is really good at something, it often comes easy to them and they don't always recognize their own genius. Mm -hmm. And when you are outside of that, you're not encumbered by your own thoughts of yourself because you're observing someone else. And you can see that and say, wow, that's that's their superpower. They're really, really good at whatever the, the, the thing might be. And when you go to them and say, I mean, if you ever go to somebody and be like, I really appreciate your superpower in X, that's awesome. A lot of times that will make somebody's day. Sometimes it'll make their year because nobody else has ever called that out. But I think identifying it is one thing, but then finding opportunities for them to use it more, they will start to see it themselves. And then they'll start to own that superpower. And then it's not just, oh, this hidden thing I do on the side because yeah, yeah, it doesn't everybody do that. It just comes natural. They start realizing, wow, I'm actually really good at that. Nobody else has, has done that. But now I've had different people in different scenarios say I'm good at that. And then my boss gave me an opportunity to do that more. And then I did this and like, maybe I'm good at that. And then they'll start looking for ways that they can apply that ability to other things. And that's when things just take off exponentially. It's just really awesome. Yes, yes, I, I agree. You know, I mean, any kind word during the course of a day from from your peers and your coworkers, it just makes your day. You know, as a as a person that did support, I, I, the users were so grateful when I fixed something. I would get cakes. I would get pies. <laughs> I would get tickets to shows. And <laughs> It's that gratitude just makes you want to pour more into them because they recognize that you're there for them, you know, and I, I've always been told I got the patience of Job because you have to <laughs> when you're in a support role, you have to, you know, some yeah. people you talk to, they already frantic about, they can't get that word doc out by nine o'clock. Um, so they all you know, wired up about that. So you got to let them go ahead and vent that out. <laughs> and then you come back to them and say, okay, we're going to make this work. We're going to get this fixed for you and you're going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. So I like your approach to dealing with people because at the end of the day, we're all human. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> 
absolutely. <laughs> so in hectic situations, how do you keep your team curious and eager to learn? When you are leading a team, it's on you to set the pace for the team. So when things get really busy, I know it's very tempting to skip over some of those reflective moments and those pauses and those health checks, but you have to avoid that temptation. Um, there are times where you, you do have to push them off or maybe delay certain things for a bit and be like, hey, things are super hectic for this deadline in three weeks and we got to power through. But after those three weeks, take a pause, check out where everybody is, do a post postmortem, do a, do a health check. <clears throat> I think that is on you as a leader to make sure you're driving that for your team because- mm -hmm. Your team will follow your pace. And the other part of that is you can't just say that and you can't just do it for the team and say, hey, guys, take a day off. And then you're sending emails all day. Right. It, it doesn't work that way. People will model your behavior. So you have to live what you preach. And if you are modeling that and taking the time to do your own assessments and health checks, um, I took a nice hearty maternity leave with each of my kids. I took a sabbatical when I wanted to take a pause and had to deal with some stuff at home. And that's actually when I started on some things for the book. I took a whole season of the project that I was working on for the last several years. And I would block off Mondays every week for several weeks at a time when we were in planning phases just to think no meetings, no running through all these things. Like this is a time to think, are we on the right path? Where do we need to go? What are those big blockers that are facing us? Like just thinking about the long-term thing. And I think we were able to make much better plans in our Tuesday through Friday hustle because of pausing on Mondays. But if you're not modeling this for your team, they're not going to do it. So it's on you to set that tone and let them know that long range planning, health checks, pausing to make sure that like, you're going in the right direction before you run a hundred miles an hour. Yes. These are not luxuries when you have time. These are essential to moving anything forward. Oh yes. Cause I, I'm every Monday I do nothing. Nice. Nothing. Nice. Love it. <laughs> and at first I felt guilty a little bit. It's like, this is Monday. Why am I doing this? <laughs> but now I look forward to it. That's my time from Friday, maybe Friday I'll do a little bit, but Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays is me just, you know, decompressing, mm -hmm. you know, and Mondays is about thinking about the direction, where we going, you know, what's working, what's not working, you know, and then Tuesday, I have meetings with my team. Mm-hmm. And I bet I your Tuesdays it. are way more productive because oh, of your Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I see the difference. I see the difference yeah. in how I feel, um, how I relate to them. Right. You know, so it's important you, you to, be, to have those moments where you just get away from it all. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Let's talk about the book. Yay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I don't have the title here, but I know it's something with Tuesday in it. <laughs> Cake on Tuesday is the title. So it's Cake on Tuesday and the subtitle is 25 Lessons to Unlock Corporate Innovation. How did you arrive at that title? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I told you I didn't have a typical business journey in my career path. I Everything about the project that, that I was writing this book about nothing was traditional in our approach to it, my path to get there. And I didn't want to have a title that just looked like every other business book. My my publisher, I had no offense to them. They recommended some great titles that were all very logical and made sense about what's in the book. But I just, I told, I told my editor at one point, I wouldn't want to read that book. Like I can't, I can't name my book that. And so Cake on Tuesday is actually uh, after one of the chapters, there's a chapter in the book called Have Cake on Tuesday. And it talks about that time in your project when you might not have an exciting milestone to be moving forward and to like lead the charge. I mentioned before, I'm like, make it easy to get to yes. I'm all about phased execution, short milestones, quick wins. 
Uh, but sometimes you have something where you're like, we need to improve the quality of X. And it's it's not that exciting. It, it, it's what you have at the end of it is necessary, but it might not be this, oh my God, it looks so vastly different from this other thing. So when you have times in your project that are not naturally inclined for a celebratory moments, you have to interject celebratory moments because we as humans love to enjoy the journey. We like to see the progress in what we're doing. And we like to just feel like we're having fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. So our staff meetings were on Tuesdays. And in talking with my operations manager, she came up with this idea of how do we inject some levity into what we're doing right now? Because we're, we're in this kind of slog to this one kind of somewhat boring milestone. And she recommended, she's a maker, crafter, sewer, does all the things. And she recommended what if she made this Wheel of Fortune style Wheel of Winning that had everybody's name on it? She's like, I'll just spin it at the end of staff meeting. Whoever's name it lands on, we're gonna they're going to be the winner for the week. I'm like, what do we do for the winner? I'm like, let's just send them a cake. Everybody loves cake. Just <laughs> no occasion cake. You just have one show up at your door that week. That'd be awesome. So we started doing that. And every Tuesday after at the end of staff meeting, we'd spin the Wheel of Winning. And if it landed on your name, you got a cake. So that's where cake on Tuesday came from. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That, that's a great idea. Who doesn't like cake? Big Who doesn't smile. love cake? <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely. Wow. So what can, will people be able to take away from your book? My book is, is focused on my desire to be simple. It is a short, simple read. It's something I, I my goal was to be able, if you're flying coast to coast, you can read the book before you land. And that, that was my goal, to make it something quick and easy, because we're all busy. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff going on. It's broken down into five sections. And then with each within each five sections, the first three are all about starting, because starting is so hard, I gave it extra attention. <laughs> and the fourth section is that is titled Leading Through the Barren Middle. And it's about that. When the, when the going gets rough, how do you persist through that? And the fifth section is insights from the rear view mirror, which were all th lessons I learned in hindsight, but I didn't necessarily understand the lesson as I was going through it. When I look back at it, I realized it. And within each of those five sections, there's five lessons that I took away from this project that I led for several years. And it is just designed to be, like I said, a short snappy read to help somebody get through their journey a little bit faster. It was a way for me to condense what I learned in, I think, eight years into one short book. And it has a lot of stories and anecdotes and fun little remembrances of the project uh, along the way. All right now. Cake on Tuesday. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to want me, I'm going to be baking cakes on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Definitely. Wow. So again, how if people want to work with you, how do they do so? so ElizabethBianyak.com. You can reach out to me for consulting and speaking on there. I am available on LinkedIn. I have following in there. And I recently just, just started using at Cake on Tuesday on both Instagram and X. You can find me there as well. Okay. Well, this was very pleasant. You brought a smile to my face. Excellent. <laughs> I really enjoyed this because all of the principles that you speak about, you know, first of all, I know I don't know everything. And my team, I have no problem telling them. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I have a social media person and if he comes up with an idea, I'm like, well, go for it. Let's see if it works. You know, right. Let's build out the plan. Let's go over it. See if any of this we already have in place. Mm -hmm. Let's make. Let's see if it works. And I'm good with it. Right. You know, right. Absolutely. I'm, because I realized that when you have a business, you are not an island. You number one, you can't do everything. It's only twenty four hours in a day, and part of that you got to sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. At least some of it. <laughs> Yeah, so it's important to make your team feel to me valued, you know, and and allow them to be them. Yes, yes, absolutely. I enjoyed writing the acknowledgement section of the book. I know a lot of times we glance over that and people don't read it, but I enjoyed writing it because it was such a reflection of so many people that interacted and helped on this multi-year journey that 
there's no way I could have done any of that on my own. Yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, that's just so important to, to elevate your team, you know, make mm -hmm. you feel like you care. Yes, All the that's, that's going to be the homework <laughs> from today's chat. Everybody's going to go home and remind somebody that is their awesome person in their life. Thank you for everything that you do, be that personal or work, because we need to be, recognize that and acknowledge that. Yes, we do. And as humans, we need that. We need to feel valued. Yes. All of us. Yes. No exception. 100%. 100%. <laughs> All righty, Elizabeth, you are the bomb.com. I am loving your spirit and keep doing what you're doing. And thank you so much for gracing just minding my business platform. Thank you, Ida. All the best.